Good morning. Let me encourage you to be making your way to your seats, and we will continue this wonderful fellowship after our service this morning. It's so good to see all of you here, some of whom we haven't seen in a while. Some of you were meeting for the first time, so it's very, very good to have you with us today for our worship assembly. As you can see, uh, Vacation Bible School begins tonight, and it's there's always a, a lot of buzz and excitement on Sunday mornings, even more so on, on the morning of the day that, that VBS starts. We're grateful for all the effort and planning and prayer that's gone into this effort. And just a reminder for some of the staff regarding the times that you will need to be here today. Uh, those who need to be here at 6 are city leaders and cookie helpers and registration workers. And those working in the marketplace, in the preschool, and puppets need to be in your areas by 7 o'clock. And just a reminder to everyone, while our evening assembly on Sundays is typically at 5, it will be at 7 tonight to sync up with our, our nightly schedule during the week for Vacation Bible School. So we look forward to that kicking off tonight. Uh, please continue to pray for our brother Willard Cooper and his loss of Nancy this past week. Uh, for those of you who would like to, to visit with Willard and the family this afternoon, they will be at Hayhurst Funeral Home from 2 to 4. And then the service will be tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock here, here in the auditorium. Mark Bellmeyer has some uh, word for us on uh, the men's retreat that's coming up this fall. So we'll turn it over to Mark. And after that, uh, Lee Turner will lead us in the shepherd's prayer. Good morning. So just real quick, I wanted to announce the men's retreat. It'll be this September 16th through 18th. Uh, Sign-ups can start today. Uh, there's some information out on both sides uh, where the communion tables are. There's some papers look like this. Uh, you can register through the QR code or link that's on the paper or the back side has a physical registration if you'd like. So whichever works best for you. Uh, we're super excited about this. It will be at the Squalia State Park again this year uh, at the group camp. So uh, for those that didn't go, we have A-frames. Uh, they have AC and heat, so it's not too terrible. Uh, but it's a great time. It will be $65 per person, all men 16 years and older. And uh, Mr. Dr Joe Brumfield will be our speaker. And so our, our topic this year will be uh, preparing your battle plan. So uh, based in Ephesians 4, 17, it says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futilities of their mind. They are darkened in, the under in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because, because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So as Christians, we shouldn't be walking around mindless. We should have a plan. We should be focused on God. And so uh, this retreat is going to help us put our focus on what is the battle plan, for spiritual battle plan for our family, our personal families, and then what is our spiritual battle plan for our church family. So we hope you all uh, will sign up and join us, and we look forward to it. Thanks. Well, once again, good morning to everyone. It's great to be here this morning as we gather together to encourage one another, to edify one another, and certainly to worship our God. Always remember to uh, check the bulletin for those that need our prayers, uh, for other uh, wonderful information that has to do with the congregation and the happenings here. Well, it's been a great summer. A lot of activity, a lot of good activity, and a lot of... Um, a lot of good work that's been taking place in spreading the gospel and reaching out and meeting needs of not only our own number, but those in our community. And we're thankful for all those and, their, and your efforts in that. We're also thankful for uh, our leadership here, and we're thankful for all of those that have a, a, a time in Bible classes and, and teaching and just all the good work that takes place here at Broken Arrow. We're so thankful for that. 
Let's go to God in prayer this morning as we continue our, our worship to him. God, we are thankful to be here today, to come before your throne of grace, your throne of mercy, your throne of love, to just ask, Father, that you continue to strengthen us in our daily walk. Continue to help us to focus on you. We have so many distractions in our world, Father, and at times we just get, we just get caught up in it. So I ask that you help us and that we, that we be resolved to, to not pattern our lives after this world, but that we be resolved to to grow closer to you and to do, do all that we can to serve you and to worship you. We're thankful, God, for the, 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 the wonderful love and the endless love that you give us. I pray that we can be lights in this world to, to show others Christ living in us. We want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and continue to strengthen them and, and, and uh, give, them, give them strength and protection. We continue to pray for all, all leaders in this world that they, that they do what's best for the people, that they do best to lead and to govern. So we pray for them and just pray that they realize that they're in those positions because of you. We know, God, that all things will work out for good for those that love and follow after you, so we, we pray and rely on that. Continue to pray for this body of believers here. Continue to pray that we reach out, that we live out, and that we follow Jesus in all that we do. We're thankful for Jesus, for the, for the sacrifice that he made on the cross and making all of this possible. It's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Good morning, family. Let's be on our feet for the first few songs. And a scripture from one of the hallelujah psalms. Praise the Lord. I will exalt the Lord with all of my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Let us sing as we sing shout hallelujah to our God. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Yeah, 
I will be reading 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Thank you, Chris. Good job, brother. So I have wonderful news. You know, like, for the top of the let God arise. I can imagine that heavenly scene when somebody's about to be baptized into Christ, right? God watching with anticipation, Jesus possibly rising out of his throne, the angels celebrating, the angels' anticipation to watch somebody baptized into Christ to join the kingdom. Well, that just happened this past week. Jalen Brown, are you here? I, I know you're here. Where is he at? Over here. Jalen, stand up. Brother Jalen was baptized this past week. So encouraging, so thankful to have you as part of the kingdom, brother. We all have our spiritual mentors, those that we look up to, those that strengthen us, that encourage us. They have good character. They're full of spirit, full of faith. And we have that that brother or that sister, right? That just, it's a great example for us to follow after. Think of that person. Who is that person for you? Who is that sister? Who is that brother? The life they live, the love they show, the love they've shown to you, right? The relationship you have with them. And here they are preaching the word, doing God's work and proclaiming his message, being the example they've been called by God to do. And they meet resistance, this mentor of yours. And imagine them being thrown down in the midst of a mob, gnashing their teeth and angry, picking up stones like the one you see on the screen, and then throwing those rocks at your mentor. Isn't that a horrific sight? The pain, the sorrow, to see your brother or your sister that you look up to having to go through so much turmoil and so much pain. And isn't that the picture we see in the book of Acts with Stephen? This man of good reputation, this man of great character, full of the Spirit, full of faith, a servant in the Lord's church, a proclaimer of God's word, just a pillar in the church, a remarkable soul. And for doing good, for being godly, for being a righteous man in this dark world, for being the salt of the earth, the mob, the crowds, they picked up stones and they threw it at him. And it wasn't like just one stone, right? I mean, just, and and I hate to be so vivid, but that's what the scripture calls for. Rock after rock, pelting hitting his arms, his legs, his elbows, his bones, his chin, his cheekbones, his head. And as he's being wailed on, I mean, a lot of us have been hit by rocks before. You know the pain of being hit by a rock? And as all of this is going on, he looks up to God. Read the text with me. Look at chapter 7, verses 58 through 60 of the, of the book of Acts. But he cried out with a loud voice, and co- or but they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell 
asleep. What a tragic scene. What a horrible scene to see a brother in Christ afflicted, persecuted, and stoned to death. But should he have been surprised, sadly? Should the first century church have been surprised? Should Peter and John been shocked when they got thrown into jail? When they were flogged for proclaiming their faith? Was Jesus shocked when he was beaten? When he was spit upon? When the nails were driven through his hands and through his feet? When a crown of thorns was put on his head and they took a club and beat on top of it to get it deep in the scalp and then put him on a cross naked for everybody to look at him, to mock him, and to laugh at him? Was he surprised? No. Stephen wasn't surprised either. Neither was Peter. And neither was John. Persecutions would follow those who followed the Lord. Hardships, turmoil, blood, pain, and death. And it's with the blood of Stephen and John and Peter and Jesus that's paved the way for us to proclaim the good news, to share the good news. So that in 2022, the change that they invoked on this world, how they turned the world upside down, well, the world is upside down in a lot of ways, and we're living in it. And we're not afraid of being flogged, at least here in America, in Broken Arrow, we're not. I'm not afraid of being stoned for standing up in front of 400 people and proclaiming God's word. I'm not afraid one bit. Because I stand on the blood of Jesus Christ and those that came before me. They've paved the way, paved the way for me, and they've paved the way for each and every one of us. And so when they had to face stones for proclaiming the truth, what do I face? What do you face as Christians? What do we face as the church? I think the biggest thing we face, the biggest hurdle we face, is that person we look in the mirror at every day. That's our biggest hurdle. It's ourselves. It's ourselves. So how do we share the good news? How do we proclaim it? How do we follow the example of Jesus and the apostles in this remarkable evangelist, Philip? Well, I think when we turn to Acts chapter 8, we could look at this example of Philip and follow it and learn how to be emboldened, learn how to grab onto the tools and the principles that he uses to share Jesus Christ. And hopefully the principles that we see here in the text will empower you, will encourage you, to take that step to proclaim God's word. But that first step, often the hardest, right, is to get uncomfortable. The church of Jesus Christ got uncomfortable. They went against a nation. They went against Israel. They went against Rome. Siblings were against siblings. Fathers against mothers. Daughters against fathers. Families were split because people were deciding to make Jesus Christ Lord of their lives because they were deciding to follow the new covenant instead of the law of Moses any longer. And so families were divided, one against each other. Even worse, even worse, those who decided to follow Christ were outcasts. They were pushed out. They lost their jobs. They lost their occupations. They lost their financial well-being. They faced the pressures of the culture, of the traditions, of a nation. But yet in the midst of that, they stood up strong and kept sharing Jesus. They were uncomfortable, right? I mean, look at Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he put them in the prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered, listen to this, went about preaching the word. Uncomfortable? Okay, let's put it to us. Imagine all of us are being persecuted, and we all leave the Broken Arrow. We leave, we leave Broken Arrow in Tulsa. 
because we can't be here anymore, because we're being persecuted for our faith. Uncomfortable? Yes. I love my house. I love my bed. I love my carpet. I love my little kitty cat. It's all real nice and comfy at home, right? You guys get that. Now imagine having to flee it because you're being persecuted. They were uncomfortable in the first century. We're not being called right now to live that kind of uncomfortable lifestyle. What are, being, what are we being called to do as Christians to share Jesus? We're being called to develop a new habit, <laughs> to change the way we're living our lives, to get a little uncomfortable so we're not living our lives holding Jesus in our own hearts and our own minds and not talking to Yes, Uh, going on a diet, that's a change that's hard, right? You know, it is. Change change is hard. Starting to budget your money, right? Maybe you've just been spending everywhere, and i got to start budgeting again. Your marriage maybe is having hardships. i got to get back and start working on my marriage again. You know, you feel like your your children are getting a little bit out of line too much. i got to hunker down. Like, change is hard to repent and to change the way you're doing things. So I'm not saying... Making ourselves sharers of Jesus and starting to proclaim the gospel everywhere we go is an easy task or is something that's just going to come naturally, unless you've been doing it. But it's a new habit. It's a change that's challenging. But it's a change, just like a diet, just like budgeting, just like any other change that's positive and good for your family and good for you. It's a change that you can accomplish, even in the midst of this culture that all of us are finding ourselves in, a culture that opposes Christ and opposes the gospel. And it's what we're called to. Change. Repentance. Jesus said it in, this, in, um, Mark chapter, or in Matthew chapter 16. You cannot be my disciple. That's a tough one, right? You cannot be my disciple if you don't pick up that cross. If you don't deny yourself and follow after me. Jesus calls for change. He calls for self-sacrifice. And sharing Jesus is part of that uncomfortable change that he's called every Christian to, to be ambassadors of him, to proclaim the good news. So, just break it to you straight, early on, it's uncomfortable at the beginning. It gets easier as you do it more and more, but it's uncomfortable to share Jesus. So get uncomfortable, begin this new habit, and start down that road. The church did it in the first century. We could do it today. Secondly, obey God. Follow Philip's example. Look at Acts chapter 8, verses 25 and following. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages, many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go, and go, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up. Moved by the love of God. We love because God first loved us. Philip knows the grace, the mercy, the power of God. And moved by the love of God, compelled by that love, God says, go. See that guy over there? See that Ethiopian eunuch? Go talk to him. Go, up and go catch up to that chariot and tell him the truth. Tell him the truth about Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He did it. He obeyed. It's pretty simple. He obeyed the Lord and he did what he was commanded to do. Much like the church did in the first century, just like in 8, chapter 4, it says, therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. They were obeying God. They're doing what they were called to do, to preach the word, to preach the gospel, to share Jesus Christ. It's a verse that we've been reading since we've been kids, or not me, but you guys, a lot of you. You've been reading since you were an infant, hearing it. Go and make disciples of all the nations, amen? We got that one. We have it in our long-term memory. 
get a little uncomfortable. Start doing it. Obey God. Of course, I want to encourage you. To do this, you've got to be motivated from the right, for the right reasons. It's got to be motivation out of the love of God. You've got to be impacted. You've got to feel his grace, his mercy, and his love in your life. And having that relationship with God and knowing how much he loves you, how can you not obey and share that love with other people? As Chris read, we're ambassadors for Christ on this earth. Ambassadors. We're living in a foreign land. And we're called to call reconciliation to the king. Are we calling for a reconciliation of the lost souls that are around us? Do you believe that there's lost souls around us? Do you believe people are in their sins, that they're separated from God because of those sins? Do you believe people are going to hell? I mean, that's, that's a, Jesus did, and he came to earth to save us. And then he said, now you guys go save. You guys go be a salt. You guys go be the light and save souls. Are we, call, are we responding to that call? Are we willing to obey when we see sinners in despair discouraged, upset, in anguish? Are we sharing the good news? Are we sharing Jesus? Brothers and sisters, we've got to get uncomfortable. We're commanded to. Brothers and sisters, we need to obey. If we're disciples of Christ, we need to obey and share the good news. So if you're here and you're saying, yeah, okay, Andrew, I'm willing to to get on it. I'm willing to start a new habit here, starting right now, and I'm going to get on this, and I'm going to start getting uncomfortable, and I'm going to start sharing my faith. I'm going to start talking to people about Jesus. I'm going to start obeying God. Maybe you're still left with that. Well, how do you do it? How do you share Jesus? How do you tell people about God? How do you enter into that conversation with the lost souls around us? Again, let's go back to Philip, because I think he provides a great model that you can return to often to see the model that he provides. First off, ask questions. Asking questions is a great tool in sharing Jesus. You know who asked a lot of questions? Jesus. Over 300 questions. Now, Jesus didn't know much, right? He had, he had a lot of questions. No, he knew everything. He knew people's intent. He knew people's hearts. He knew what they were thinking. He knew the full counsel of God. He knew God. He was God. And he asked questions? Why? He could have just told everybody everything. Because he was trying to save souls. He was trying to bring people to him. Let's learn from his example and from disciples that followed him and ask the questions as well. Take some time. If you're wondering what good questions are there to ask people to invoke this conversation about Jesus, just go read the 300 plus questions of Jesus. Say, oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. And you'll see, man, I'm loaded. I'm ready to go. I could get out there and share this word with this list of questions and I could start great conversations with people and make them do most of the talking. Really? Ask questions. Just like Philip did. Look at verse 30 in Acts chapter 8. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? How many times have you seen somebody sitting at a coffee shop or sitting at your job or doing something similar and they have a Bible or they're reading their Bible? What a great op Do you understand what you're reading? They say, yeah, I understand it. Can you explain it to me? How do you see it? What do you I think Jesus even asked that question, right? How do you see it? What do you understand that to teach? Man, open up the conversations. Ask questions. And it does open doors when you do. But here's a pivotal point. When you ask questions, don't ask them because you're getting ready to preach to them what you want to say. Ask questions to hear their response. You've got to listen to what they say in response. Jesus did that too because he wanted to meet people where they were. And that's the next point. Once you ask those questions, you've got to connect. You've got to listen, and then you've got to connect to the person that you're listening to. And there's all kinds of people out there, right? You got atheists that say there is no God. 
You got agnostics that say, we're not sure. Is there a God? Is there not a God? You have theists that say, yes, there's a God. You have some people that believe there is, that Jesus Christ is God. You have some people that believe that the Bible is God's word. And then you got all these different religions out there, all these different faiths. That, I mean, when you're talking about people, you're talking about all kinds of faiths, all kinds of beliefs, all kinds of religions. So we need to, to, to connect with them. You need to listen to them to see where they are at. And once you figure out where they're at, what their faith is, which takes a lot of listening, then you connect with them and start from where they are. I mean, Jesus Christ, he sees the woman at the well, and he uses the well to connect with her. The water. Wow. What are we using to connect with those around us to share Jesus Christ? And Philip kind of had it nice, though, right? <laughs> I mean, where, where the Ethiopian was, I wish I could want, what are you reading? Oh, who is this guy? Well, thanks. I'll go ahead and talk to you about that, right? But look at this text, verse 31 through 35 of Acts chapter 8. It reads, And he said, Well, how can I unless someone guides me? Okay. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture, which he was reading, was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him, connected with him. He started with him where he began. And that's what we need to do. Whether it's an atheist, an agnostic, a theist, somebody that has faith in the word, we need to connect with them where they are and go from there. And when we connect when we realize where they're at and realize what they need in regards to their faith, it's then that we share Jesus. Look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus. Now what does that mean? It's a synecdoche. It's a part for a whole. He preached the gospel. He preached the good news. He preached the message that saves he preached that Jesus Christ came to this earth to save sinners. He preached that we're sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He preached that. He said we all are in need of a Savior. He preached that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected from the grave. He conquered death. And that through the death, burial, and the resurrection, we too can have salvation. He preached that. He preached that we as as lost souls need to repent, we need to stop serving sin and being slaves to sin and start obeying Jesus Christ. We need to start making him Lord of our lives. We need to repent and turn to him. We need to be his disciple. Not man's, not my own, not some idol, not some false god, but Jesus' disciple. And we need to confess him. We need to proclaim him as, as Lord and Lord of our lives. And as this sinner and as this wretch Philip preached that you need to be baptized into Christ. Have your sins washed away. Obey the gospel. Die, be buried, and be raised up to live a new life. Philip preached Jesus. Philip preached the gospel. What's the result? You can see it right there in verse 36. As they went along the road, they came on some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? The message of Jesus included the message of baptism, and the eunuch wanted to be baptized. Share Jesus, brothers and sisters. Get uncomfortable. Obey God. Ask questions. Connect. Share Jesus with the lost souls that are around us. And use all the tools and all the talents and everything you have to do it. Use the Christian evidences. Use logic and reason. Use history. Use science. Use the facts. Get all of that out there. But sometimes even those things don't work, right? I had a brother, an evangelist, one of the best evangelists I know. He sat down with the girl and she, she doubted in God and Jesus. She just wasn't sure if it was all real or not. So he went through all the Christian evidences, and that didn't respond to her. He went through how the Bible is God's authority on earth, and 
She just didn't respond to that. He went through Jesus and gave important points about Jesus. He's like, man, I'm at a loss. How do I? She's willing to study. She's willing to sit down with me. But how do I bring her to Christ? And he he said, okay, we're going to study Mark. And so he opened up the gospel of Mark. He started at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and just started working through the text with her. I think he said he got to like chapter 7. And she's like, I want to be baptized. People respond different ways to different things. I know I did. And so we got to be willing to share Jesus and try to connect with people in those different ways. You think about Paul. How did he try to convert people in the book of Acts? Two times he uses his conversion story to try to convert souls. He talked about how he became a Christian. And it worked. And it didn't another time, right? But he used it. You see Peter and Stephen, what are they calling on? They're looking at the Old Testament. They're using that to preach Jesus to show them. There's many ways to preach the gospel. There's many ways to start from point A to get to point B and proclaim God's word. But our goal is the same for each and every one of us. Share Jesus. Share the gospel. Share Jesus. I can't imagine that first century enduring the persecutions that they faced and the hardships they faced and had to take on. And some of us might have been been persecuted a little bit. We might face some hardships, but I don't think anybody here has been to the point of shedding blood. And I honestly believe, and please come talk to me afterwards if you think I'm wrong, but I think our biggest challenge is ourselves. We know what we should do. We've been reading the commands from infancy, Yet perhaps we're not doing it as diligently and as much as the first century church did, as much as God calls us to do. We have a great week ahead of us with VBS, right? We have a wide open door to share Jesus. We're going to have visitors, we're going to have families, we're going to have parents that we've never seen possibly coming through our doors. We're going to have people that are going to have open hearts to the idea of Jesus. And we got the opportunity. And what are we going to do with it, right? Right? We had new heights over the summer. I don't know how many kids are over there. It seems like thousands, but it's probably about 100. Bunch of kids, and those kids all have families. Share Jesus. This morning, I'm sure we have some visitors. I'm sure there's people sitting in these pews, maybe even right next to you, and you don't know them. Share Jesus. Get uncomfortable. (laughs) Ask questions. Connect with them. Obey God and share Jesus. Jesus said it. Go preach the the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And it's my prayer and it's my hope that when we share Jesus, that they'll respond just like the eunuch did and say, look, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said in verse 37, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Let's share the good news, brothers and sisters, so that we can see people go along their way rejoicing, just like you did when you became a Christian. If you're here this morning, and perhaps you don't know Jesus, perhaps you haven't obeyed the gospel, you haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, like Ananias asked Paul, what are you waiting for? And and that's a good question. There's another question, right? What are you waiting? I ask that sometimes to the teens that know the gospel. It's like, what are you waiting for? That's a good question. What are you waiting for this morning? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're here this morning and perhaps... You haven't been sharing Jesus. You haven't been obeying the Lord like you should be. You haven't been motivated by the love of God to confess his name amongst the people you live around. I want to encourage you to get uncomfortable and start doing that. And if you want the prayers of the church to empower you, to encourage you to do that more often, please come forward and ask for them. If you're here this morning and you have another sin you're struggling with that's impeded your walk with Christ, and you'd like the prayers of the elders in this congregation, Please come forward as we stand and as we sing. And clean up.
this is the time of the service where we're going to uh, commemorate Jesus' death. Um, and one of the things I wanted to look at today was kind of what the Romans and what the Jews of that time would have really thought about crucifixion in that day and really what the cross means to us. Um, so we'll be looking at some of the things that Cicero said, who was a Roman orator, and uh, in about 70 BC, there was a Roman citizen named Publius Gavius who denounced a corrupt Roman magistrate named Gaius Verus. I know they make these names really easy. Um, and uh, Verus had a misgovernment and mismanagement of his citizens, and uh, Verus was infuriated by what he had said. So he committed the ultimate taboo by having that innocent Roman man uh, beaten and crucified with his cross facing Rome. Uh, news of his abominable act spread, he faced trial, and uh, he was found guilty and consequently exiled. Uh, the prosecutor of Cicero stated during the case that it is a crime to bind a Roman citizen, to scourge him is a wickedness, to put him to death is almost like killing one's parents. What shall I say then of crucifying him? So guilty an action cannot, be, uh, cannot by any possibility be adequately expressed by any name bad enough for it. Yet, with all this, that man Varus was not content. Let Gavius behold his country, he said. Let him die within the sight of the laws and liberty of Rome. It was not Gavius. It was not one individual. I know not whom. It was not one Roman citizen. It was the common cause of freedom and citizenship that you, Varus, exposed to that torture and nailed upon the cross. About a hundred years after this cruel abuse of power, we know of the even worse event that occurred uh, to a Jewish man in Jerusalem uh, during a festival commemorating the Passover. Um, if it was detestable how much that Gavius, an innocent man, was bound, whipped, and killed with his cross facing Italy, how much more horrific was it that Jesus, God in the flesh, instead of being welcomed as the true king that he was, was rejected by his own creation, that he was beaten and enthroned on a cross just outside of Jerusalem, the throne of his forefather David, and just a short distance away from the temple, the supposed dwelling place of God. Jesus suffered the ultimate injustice in the most humiliating form of death and unimaginable pain to rescue us from exile and to redeem us from sin. Elsewhere, Cicero also said that the mere mention of crucifixion should be far removed, not only from the persons of Roman citizens, but from their thoughts, their ears, and their eyes. For not only the fact and endurance of these things, but the mere possibility of being exposed to them, the expectation, the mere mention of them even, is unworthy of a Roman citizen and of a free man. Worshiping a crucified God was nonsense to the Romans, and the Jews witnessed many messianic movements end in mass crucifixions. The early Christians knew just how absurd that the Christian message was. As Paul puts it, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, as he says in 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verse 23. Paul was tasked with this very unpopular message. What kind of a God would be crucified? And who would want to serve him and worship him? Yet when Paul shared the message, he didn't try to water it down to make Jesus more presentable to make us feel better. Uh, he didn't want to leave out the embarrassing business about the cross. Instead of making the idea of the cross far removed from our thoughts, our ears, and our uh, eyes, he, made, he knew the cross was crucial to understanding God's love for us. The cross is the depths that God was willing to go for us to rescue us. That God would humble himself in the form of a servant and experience death on a cross is still beyond comprehension. And it is this reversal that's so important. As Paul puts in Galatians 6.14, But as for me, I will never boast about anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross, and I to the world. So this morning, as we take of communion, let us remember Jesus' suffering on the cross uh, through the bread that represents his body and the cup that represents his blood. And let us remember how God endured rejection and the ultimate humiliation because of his love for us. Please bow. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sacrificing your son. Thank you for giving the ultimate sacrifice of sending him down to earth as a human, and dying on the cross with our sins bore on his shoulders. He washed our sins away and died on the cross just for us, not for his sins, because he was perfect. Please let us be reminded about this and to truly remember as we're taking the bread, the sacrifices he committed. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's continue. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you again, continue our remembrance. Lord, we just uh, continue want to be reminded of uh, Jesus' sacrifice for us, the blood he shed for us, his resurrection, and our eternal hope in him. It's in this we pray. Amen. Stay with me, family. Stay with me for just a little bit longer at the table. Don't leave the table just yet. I want us to continue our remembrance of what Jesus came out here to do with his death, and his resurrection. Then now we have hope. So if we sing, go into this next song, I want us to really focus on the words of the song, and what that, what his living hope represents for us. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the dark.
everybody back. Our star of the guest is going to be awesome. I'm excited about it. Thank you for the words today. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Not at five. You can. I'm sure we can put you to work. But at seven o'clock is when that starts. Starts at seven o'clock tonight. And everything for the words today. Uh, we get out there. Reminder that we need to get out there and really uh, show the world the evangelize. So let's close with this song. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one. you uh, uh, for contributions we have trays in the back of the auditorium uh, if you need that you can mail the contribution in you can get online you can come by the office multitude of ways that we can that we can do this and certainly want to encourage you to continue your contributions so we can uh, continue the good work here from Broken Arrow so if you would bow with me please Father God we do thank you for this time that we've spent together we we thank you for your son, we thank you for his death and the hope that we have in him. Father, as we, as we go from this place, we, we pray that we can uh, show that we are Christians by our love and, and that we can uh, go to the world and, and, um, and, and show your son through us. Father, thank you for the time that we've had together. We, we thank you for the fellowship that we have here at Broken Arrow. And, and Father, we thank you for, uh, for all things that, uh, that you do give us. Thank you again for your son. Thank you for the hope we have in him. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.